Chapter 39, Resurgent, Part 1 You are the spare, nothing more. If you wish to be considered more than that, then you must earn it. Asterisk 10 o'clock, December 20, 2015, Briefing Room, Canterlot To say that Princess Luna had never felt fear in her life would not be accurate. Various shades of anxiety plagued her regarding interaction with other ponies in the weeks and months after the elements had freed her. Her sister's penchant for pranks during the winter holidays had given Luna what might be considered a mild phobia of wrapped packages. More recently when Twilight had vanished from Ekestria due to Discord's machinations, Luna had purposefully avoided dwelling on what horrors the young unicorn might have been going through. None of those feelings compared to the horror and dread that she felt as she stared into the frozen scene that the changelings had presented to her the day before. None of her previous fears held a candle to the horror and dread that blossomed within Luna when the nature of the Windigo was revealed. No matter how many centuries or millennia passed, Luna was certain that Kadance's pleading and pain-filled expression from the depths of the alien machinery would be waiting for her every time she closed her eyes to sleep. I have reviewed the dossiers on the aliens catalogued thus far, the zebra representative Oven commented, pulling Luna out of her thoughts. I do not recall seeing any mention of a sectoid matching this description being encountered thus far. I find it hard to believe that such things would be capable of subduing an alicorn. The heads of the assembled leaders swiveled towards the two humans in the room. High Talon Alvar seemed oddly distracted and kept glancing towards the humans, the frozen image suspended in the center of the room, and the doors. Captain Star Shot of the Night Guard sat in shining armor's seat, the former being nominated by the latter to take strategic command of the operation. Asterion's seat was vacant, though any considerations as to the reason for his absence would have to wait. We've suspected for some time that the aliens are capable of modifying the physical characteristics of the sectoids to fit whatever role they deem fit, Van Dorn explained, his expression neutral as he stared at the sectoid with the multitude of metal limbs sprouting from its back. On Earth, we've encountered sectoids with significantly enhanced mental capacity and others that are hardwired into something like our mech units. It's our speculation that these spider sectoids are used by the aliens to convert and create other creatures into what we've seen in the field. It's likely that we have no records of encountering them yet because they couldn't find a species worth the effort to convert on Earth. Starshot cleared her throat and leaned forward, her eyes wide as she spoke. I don't doubt your conclusions, but it begs the next question, is it that their presence here means that they intend to do this to every creature on the planet? The silence that fell after the question was deafening before it was punctured by the woman sitting beside Van Dorn. No, we don't believe that is their plan, Major Renfeld said. The collective sigh of relief from the room halted as she continued, intelligence believes that the aliens choose species and specimens that interest them for their collective. It seems that the griffins qualify due to their physical traits and discipline, as do the alicorns for their magical capacity. Once organized resistance has been crushed, the aliens will likely take samples of each major race to test them. Those that pass would be assimilated. Those that fail would be purged. The dispassionate explanation contrasted with the growing horror from the others in the room before Luna put her hoof down. Such speculation merely emphasizes the importance of this operation, she said sternly, locking eyes with each of the other leaders in the room. At this time, I see three major obstacles for the operation. Tyrek, the Damocles Ethereal, and the Windigo. What can we do to remove Tyrek from the battle? A half dozen sniper teams have him as their priority target. I would normally say that would be enough, but his magic is the wild card, Renfeld answered immediately before scratching the side of her chin. I'll also be in the field with my own squad and we'll be carrying some of the jammer grenades that we recovered from Exalt. Oven was quick to contribute to the improving mood. My best alchemist is working on a possible solution as well. This Tyrek may be capable of stealing the magics that creatures can channel, but the natural magics of alchemy and the world should be immune to his manipulation. Our goal is to render him powerless, though we may have to settle with simply weakening him to the point where conventional methods are effective. Standing order for the guard is to avoid confrontation with Tyrek if at all possible, 
Star Shot said with a helpless shrug. Every pony he steals magic from makes him more powerful, and I don't want to add to the problem. Unfortunate, but the correct decision, Luna agreed with a nod. Tyrek may not be the primary objective, but his presence severely restricts what can be fielded effectively. Once he is no longer a threat, greater assets may be called upon. What plans do we have in place to defeat Damocles? Van Dorn was the next to speak, though it wasn't hard to miss the sour look on Renfeld's face as he spoke. The assets assigned to deal with Tyrek also have Damocles as their next target, but if this ethereal is anything like the ones we've faced on Earth then they might not be effective. I've given him as priority target to the Ment Materia specialists. If they can get close, they stand a good chance of dealing with him. The conversations continued about the various potential problems that the ethereal might present on the battlefield, but Luna's attention shifted back to Alvar. The young griffin had been accompanied to the meeting by one of the surviving Legion generals, but the latter had excused himself in a hurry from the briefing. Considering the success of this operation would result in his homeland being retaken and the survivors freed from captivity, the young High Talon's distraction was, disconcerting. A knock at the door brought the current conversations to a halt, and all eyes turned to see the Griffin General return. A second Griffin followed behind the General, wrapped from beak to tail in a black cloak. The only part of this new arrival that could be seen beyond the cloak was a single gnarled talon that grasped a short staff for support. The staff itself was simple wood, though Luna's eyes were drawn to the red gem which set atop it and the gold flame setting that held it in place. I beg your pardons, Alvar finally spoke as the two new arrivals approached the center of the chamber. Would it be possible to reverse the image back to when the changeling spy first entered Low Peak? Luna nodded in response and set action to words. It seems an odd request, but I suspect some underlying purpose to it, she thought as the image settled. The three griffins immediately launched into a frenzy of hushed whispers as Alvar pointed at one place specifically in the image. The lunar princess's gaze followed the outstretched talon and did a double take when she spotted what was undoubtedly the cause of the commotion. The fighting for the griffin capital had been by all reports a bloody massacre. When Alvar had first arrived in Canterlot, he had only briefly touched on the subject of the battle, and no pony had wanted to press him on the details. By all accounts, the first legion had been wiped out to the last and the second legion had been shattered while buying time for the third and fourth to escape the capital with as many non-combatants as possible. Only one other force of griffins of note had fought during the battle, and having their fates confirmed gave even Luna a moment of pause. All that remained of the low peak settlements was melted rubble and corpses that littered the pathways. The signs of carnage intensified down the central boulevard exiting the city, leading up to a massive pile of bodies both alien and griffin. At the center of the massacre, amidst the decay and discarded weapons, were several pieces of distinctive griffin armor, untarnished despite the elements and battle. The scene that Alvar had spotted was all that remained of the last stand of the Myrmidons. Again I apologize for the interruptions, Alvar said as he resumed his seat at the table, the conversation with the black-cloaked figure finished as he hobbled away with his curious staff. Alvar's posture was ramrod straight as he looked at each of the assembled leaders in turn. I have received news from those that still remain in Grifos. The Talons commanding the 3rd and 4th legions have gone to ground near the capital, and can launch their attacks in concert with ours on a moment's notice. The young griffin's eyes fell upon the humans, and he deflated just a little. I am afraid I must request the services of Lieutenant Zhang for the duration of this operation. His efforts will be necessary in securing more assets for the fight. Van Dorn gave Renfeld a sideways glance before nodding. I'm sure that we will be able to accommodate that request, he said with a nod. You have my thanks for this favor, Alvar replied sincerely, though his relief soured when he spotted the look that Renfeld had on her face. The High Talon might have returned the glare in equal measure had the general beside him not cleared his throat to get his attention. Another flurry of whispers passed between the two, and the young High Talon stepped down from his seat. I apologize for these disruptions. The general will be assuming my place for the rest of this meeting, 
Alvar explained before casting a glance towards Asterion's empty seat as he walked to the door. The cloaked griffin, who had remained silent through the entire exchange, followed the high talon out. Silence again passed between the assembled leaders before Ovan cleared his throat. There is one last threat that we could potentially encounter, yes. Very true, Luna confirmed, and the image in the center of the room again shifted to Princess Kadanth's horrifying expression from within the depths of the alien machine. If the previous encounter with the Windigo can be reproduced, then it may be the most dangerous of all three. We... We are prepared to do what is necessary to eliminate this threat, and after a lengthy discussion, we feel there is only one that might prove a countermeasure to it. Asterisk 1230, December 20, 2015, Office of Asterion, Minotaur Compound, Canterlot. Well, I suppose this explains where all of the Minotaurs went, Firecracker thought as she passed the two armored guards at the entrance. Just past the large double doors, Stacks of crates and equipment broke the courtyard up into neat rows that stretched its entire length. Quartermasters could be seen leading teams of workers as they continued to add to the inventory. I hadn't seen a single minotaur since yesterday aside from those manning the guns, and there doesn't appear to be a single one preparing for the upcoming operation. What's going on here? Asterion is expecting you, a voice addressed Firecracker, which pulled her from her observations of the compound. The speaker was another minotaur, who motioned down the nearby corridor. I will take you to him now. The walk was a silent one, and mercifully short. The minotaur didn't speak a word, but he still radiated a nauseating mix of confusion, outrage, and resignation. Firecracker was saved from those bitter emotions by others that were far more familiar. Ah, there's Princess Twilight and Captain Harris. Just the sweet palate cleanser I needed after dealing with the last few days. Being in the same room as Shining Armor when he found out the truth was, not pleasant. As for Twilight, I suppose I can understand Shining's reasoning in not telling her about Cadence. She would likely do something rather rash. A third, less familiar flavor entered the emotional mix, one of determination, nervousness, and impatience. If she had a few more minutes to put her hoof on it, she might have identified the source, but the presence of the Myrmidon standing guard at the entrance solved the mystery rather quickly. Ah, Alvar. I can certainly sympathize with him, but why is he here? Come to think of it, why are all of them here? The smallest prickles of paranoia began to poke at the back of Firecracker's mind, but she kept any of it from showing as her escort opened the door and motioned for her to enter the room. Well, hello. Fancy seeing all of you here, she greeted the trio in the waiting room as though she hadn't known before the door had opened. I take it that all of you were summoned by Asterion regarding serious business, then. Do Minotaurs have business that isn't serious? Alvar asked, his expression completely straight and without a trace of humor in it. Confusion entered his features when Matt, Twilight, and Firecracker burst into smiles at the comment. What? Was it something I said? Don't worry about it, Matt was quick to reply, though the ghost of his grin remained. Do any of you know why we're here? Not exactly, but it isn't a social call, Twilight answered as she looked down to a scroll sitting beside her. When I was still in school, Princess Celestia had me organize some of her older correspondence from the other nations. The only times that I've seen when the Minotaurs are polite in written correspondence is when they need something. Twilight's eyebrows angled downwards in annoyance. Even with Princess Celestia, most of their letters were rather rude. Well, point to you, Princess, Firecracker thought, and she added a bit of mental applause afterward. I can read the body languages most races fairly well, but I didn't pick up on that little quirk in the invitation at all. So I take it we have no idea what's going on then. Asterion's entrance from the opposite end of the room halted any answers to Firecracker's question. His expressions and emotions were carefully controlled as he closed the door behind him. I apologize for taking you from your tasks at this time, but an emergency has arisen, he explained, his quiet tone a stark contrast to every other time Firecracker had seen him. 
he produced a scroll from within his coat and presented it to Twilight. Would you please read this aloud, Princess? Sure, she answered immediately as she took the parchment from Asterion with her magic. The scroll unfurled and she began to dictate from the letter, her chipper tone quickly dissolving into disbelief. Asterion, effective immediately, you are to halt all operations in Canterlot, be they support or direct action. The Council of Consensus has called a vote to, to determine if further participation in this war benefits the nation of Minon. What is the meaning of this? Asterion's calm front finally cracked as his face twisted into a snarl. After young Alvar brought news from Grifos, I sent a sternly worded letter to the Council that it was in everyone's interest to fight this war to the last. I had thought the matter settled at that, but it seems my idiot brother found some way to bring the issue to a vote. I have no idea what that damned fool thinks he's doing, but he wouldn't have attempted this unless he has some card up his sleeve that's made of pure plated platinum. The Alliance needs unity, Alvar said, his earlier confusion banished in favor of the at attention pose that his father had favored. If we lose that, the invaders will take each of our nations apart like they did mine. This cannot be allowed. For every ounce of determination that Alvar showed, Matt mirrored it with equal amounts of hesitation. I agree with you, High Talon, but unless we have definitive proof of alien influence or interference in Minon, then XCOM will not act. The foundation of our organization is the defense of every member nation against external threats, not the elimination of politicians who have different opinions. Stupid, dangerous, suicidal opinions I'll agree but I can guarantee that Van Dorn will not greenlight any operation for the sake of political expediency. Asterion held up one thick hand and glanced to all of the assembled. I have not invited you here in any official capacity from your organizations. I've did so to ask for your help as individuals based on your experiences with these monsters. Princess Twilight, you were the first native of this world to encounter the invaders and you're the only one who's encountered and survived two fights against their leaders. Hi Talon Alvar, your father was a respected acquaintance of my family, and you were there when Grifos was attacked. Captain Harris, I've been told that you have been fighting the aliens longer than anyone else involved in this war, with experience from both your own world and this one. Asterion looked to each in turn, no doubt hoping to reassure them or lead them to his next point but each word only produced a heady mix of negative emotions. Firecracker tasted near panic from twilight at the mention of the ethereals, grief from Alvar as undoubtedly painful memories resurfaced, and near bottomless guilt from Matt at the compliment on his record. The changeling started to ask why she had been invited, only for Asterion to beat her to it. Like Princess Twilight and Captain Harris, you've encountered the aliens on both Earth and here and you no doubt have some insight into something that none of us do, how they feel. We can clearly see their monstrous nature in their actions, but you're the only one that can tell us of the ugly emotions that drive them, Asterion concluded. There's just one problem with that plan. The invaders don't feel anything, Firecracker thought, her mind drifting back to the alien encounters where she had tried to read their emotions. There is no outrage no righteous justification, or even joy in their cruelties. In a way they're like changeling drones, carrying out the orders of the matriarch without the capability of even forming an opinion on what they're doing. So we are to give our testimony to the Council of Consensus then? I don't think any of us can spare the months it will take to debate every point on the subject. There is only one way we can resolve this with the speed we need for survival, Asterion said surrendering the assessment of the council's speed without even acknowledging it. We are going to see my brother, and talk some sense into the fool. If we can convince him to withdraw the issue before the council, then that resolves the issue right quick. I've already spoken with those planning the upcoming operation, and they have agreed to this little trip to resolve this issue immediately. If we delay, it will go to the council. If that happens, our aid in the war effort will be so tied up in debate that it wouldn't matter. Firecracker shared a glance with Matt and Alvar, but it was Twilight who asked the most obvious question. What will happen if we talk to your brother, but he isn't convinced by our arguments? A sour look crossed Asterion's face as he crossed his arms. 
then you all may enjoy my hospitality for the day, and I will resume the debate with the idiot on a less verbal level. A moment of silence passed before he continued, I will release you to make any preparations that are necessary. We will be leaving this evening. Asterisk 1800 hours, December 20, 2015, Vault of the Sun, Canterlet. Captain Shining Armor, you are aware of the enemy we may face in the upcoming battle, Princess Luna had said, her tone grave. If the invaders have truly turned Princess Cadence into one of their abominations, then it is the greatest singular threat to this world. If there is even the smallest spark of what she once was, then you may be the only pony capable of stopping her. In the coming battle, it falls to you to free her, one way or another. The memory of Shining's last conversation with Luna hounded him just as surely as the image of Cadence trapped in the alien machinery as he sat silently in front of the vault door. In preparation for the coming battle, Luna had given Shining permission to retrieve an item from the vault to assist him in his singular duty. When he had exited the vault and sealed it behind him, Luna had ordered the guards within to leave out of respect for what Shining would soon have to do. And so Shining was left alone with nothing but the the dual burdens of what had happened and what would happen, and the last memento his wife had left behind, the crystal heart. Any hopes that Shining had about finding some hidden message or power reserved to aid in the coming battle had been premature. The last iota of Cadence's power had vanished from the heart with her last message to him, and now it was little more than a pretty paperweight. The heart responds to emotion. I just need to concentrate, Shining thought as he again put his hoof on the center of the heart. He closed his eyes as he tried to force his thoughts past the moment when he first heard that she had been attacked, the message she had left for him, the image of Cadence being devoured by that cold and heartless machinery. Shining's eyes snapped back open as he retracted his hoof from the crystal heart. Just as when he had first retrieved it from the vault, no magic resided in the artifact, no inner glow of magic. I have to do this. I have to focus. I can make this work. I have to make this work. He told himself as he placed his hoof on the heart to try again. Captain. The question made Shining jump on the spot before he recognized the voice. Yes, Sergeant. Is there a reason for the interruption, he asked more than a little of his frustration bleeding into his voice. When he turned to see that the guard was not alone, he straightened and gave a short bow. My apologies, Miss. Z.A. Cora? Things have not been easy as of late. You need not make apologies. I sense you mind is ill at ease, the zebra said, and she bowed to the guard as he left. She slipped her saddle bags off and began to remove several small items from within. The path ahead has many a concern, but with this assistance, they can be easily spurned. My fathers will desire that we do not meet an ill fate, but there are things that can be used to an effect that is great. The curse of the ever-free is as potent as one's wrathful desire, but I warn you that this is meant only when things are most dire. The effects within cannot be designed, and it may, worryingly, be the last of its kind, she explained as she pushed a small glass sphere forward its contents hidden by the smoky tint. I don't understand how the alchemist's potions work, but I know that they do work. Plus having a distraction right now is what I need, Shining thought as he nodded. The smoked glass sphere was levitated into one of the pouches on his combat harness. I'm sure it will turn the tide when I use it, Shining said before turning back to Z.A. Cora. Was there anything else? The zebra didn't immediately reply her gaze had fallen to the crystal heart that now rested beside Shining. Carrying that into war, with matters so grim? It is a concern then, that it looks so dim. The stories didn't do it justice, you know, Shining said with a sigh as he looked down at the artifact beside him. When Cadence had it in her possession, it was brilliant. I don't think I'll ever restore it to a fraction of what it was. It responded to the emotions she valued most and I can't seem to manage them. In times that are dark, happiness finds it difficult to make a mark, Z.A. Cora mused to herself, the sounds of clinking glass and pottery coming from her saddlebags as she shifted some. To the current events, there is not much I can truly do. 
I only ask that you remember as best you can, when she first said I love you. Shining Armor's gaze hadn't left the crystal heart until just then, only to find himself practically snout to snout with Zia Cora. Her unexpected proximity combined with her words caused him to recoil with a sharp intake of breath. Rather than the musty odor of the vault of the sun's rarely traveled entry chamber, Shining's involuntary inhalation carried, the sweet scent of honeysuckle, and the smell of grass and spring rain. For one agonizingly short moment, Shining was on a hillside with no pony but Cadence, the mare's expression caught between a blush and fear at letting slip those three little words. In that moment, Shining's heart soared. Like the light of the setting sun, the moment slowly faded. Nearly a minute had passed before Shining had realized that he had been staring blankly at Zia Cora, who had moved back to a respectful distance with a small purple vial clamped firmly shut between her hooves. I'm sorry for pushing you into what may have been a painful memory, but this potion has been known to have a potent energy. Under other circumstances, Shining would have called having such a thing happen the worst kind of violation and stormed out of the room. He wanted to be offended, or angry at Zia Cora, but hearing those words from Cadence gave him pause. In all of the loss and despair that defined the current time, Shining Armor had been given a reminder that he need not be defined by it. The giddy happiness of the memory, the hope he had all those years ago, bled into him and he clung to it like a drowning pony to a life preserver. After several minutes, Shining could only manage a single word. Why? Once, you were strong, on top of the world, now it is plain that you try to keep your resolve fully unfurled, Zia Cora explained, a wan smile on her face. Strength in each battle is needed to save the one most dear but true strength of purpose and will means fighting away one's fear. Zia Cora's words and the memory of Cadence haunted Shining, so much so that he didn't even notice the zebra leave. I have to save my wife, he thought as he closed his eyes and rested a hoof against the crystal heart. No, that's not right. I will save my Cadence, no matter the cost. Underneath Shining's hoof, the crystal heart slowly began to glow from within. Asterisk 1830, December 20, 2015, above the Western Sea. Despite the seriousness of the situation, Twilight couldn't help but grin like a little foal as she alternated between gazing out of the airship window and scrutinizing every single detail of the craft that she could see. It feels like I'm sitting in a little pocket of the future. She thought as her gaze settled on the Pegasus mare sitting in the pilot's couch. I had heard that Skybolt was a brilliant inventor but that barely scratches the surface. I bet she's as good with machines as I am with magic. Engaging engines, now, the Pegasus reported, a slight shudder going through the frame of the airship shortly after. Dexterous hooves manipulated the controls like a musician might manipulate a fine instrument, and a muted rumble could be heard from the aft section as the main engines opened up. Gathering magic at the prow of the ship distracted Twilight from what Skybolt said next, but her curiosity was interrupted when the sounds of the engine stopped and was replaced with the low whistle of wind flying by the cabin. Congratulations, every pony, we've successfully broken the sound barrier. We should be arriving in the Minon Island chains in approximately 20 minutes. Skybolt announced with a proud grin as she glanced over her shoulder. Asterion snorted from the back of the passenger cabin, trying his best to look annoyed as he bent over to keep his horns from scraping the roof. His body posture didn't match the excitement in his eyes. It took the best engineers in Minon four generations to create a non-prop engine with enough stability and force to achieve and maintain flight. A Pegasus looks at the engine for two weeks and manages to double the output without sacrificing safety. Right shame you weren't born with horns and hands. Skybolt. You would have gone quite far. It isn't just the engines, is it? Twilight asked as much to herself as anyone else, and she pointed a hoof to the wide glass panels and canopy between Skybolt and the night sky. You've got some kind of projection in front of the ship, with two layers. Her face scrunched up as she probed the outside of the ship with her senses. The first looks like a conical shaped shield, with the second layer a. Uh, I see. The shield improves the aerodynamics and the second spell effect is actually pulling the airship in the cone's wake. 
that's brilliant. Sky Bolt flashed a million bit smile as she glanced back over her shoulder. Absolutely right, Princess. The time on Earth gave me a lot of ideas for how to improve my little hummingbird, she explained, giving the console a gentle pat. The new engines are definitely a step up over what I had before. The last piece of the puzzle was to dedicate the magic projector in the nose to do just what you said. Are there other projectors on the ship? What do they do? Twilight asked, curiosity burning a hole in her mind. The humans have been combining magic with their technology but they always put emphasis on what they are familiar with over the unknown. I can scarcely imagine what some pony like Sky Bolt could do given that she's equestrian and grew up with magic in the first place. The question and Twilight's enthusiasm seemed to make Sky Bolt uneasy. Oh, they do, you know, things. To places, and stuff. When Twilight didn't relent, the Pegasus turned back to her instruments. Well, you know this is technically a warship, right? And warships usually have weapons, right? Comprehension came over Twilight and quashed her excitement like a bug under hoof. Ah, I see. Well, I hope they're effective, she added, regretting that she had brought up the subject at all. I know that they're necessary, and they might save our lives, but I don't like it. I wish all we needed magic for was to help make people's lives better. I wonder if she feels the same way about her inventions. A quick glance to Sky Bolt's slightly slumped posture lent some credence to the thought. A small touch on her side was enough to bring Twilight back into the moment as she turned to the person sitting beside her. The touch had come from Matt's leg against her barrel, and it retreated almost immediately after contact had been made. I'm sure those won't be necessary but this is pretty exciting. Is this your first time flying? Matt asked, before appending the question. Well, not flying under your own power. There was a hot air balloon back at Ponyville that I used to take rides in with Spike, Twilight explained, her eyes dropping from his to catch the twitch of Matt's hand. I wish he would give me a pat on the head or an ear scratch already, but Matt's been acting so strange about it lately. He kinda reminds me of Shiny back when he first met Cadence. The memory of her stalwart and heroic brother flailing about while in the merciless grasp of his teenage years brought a silly grin to Twilight's face. Well, maybe not quite like Shiny. I can't imagine Matt ever acting that awkward because he doesn't know what to do. The silly thought was followed by a natural question. Come to think of it, does he know what to do? Do I know what to do next? I still haven't had that talk with Rarity yet. The maddening series of questions continued to get worse, and it certainly wasn't helped by the knowing smirk that Firecracker sent her way from across the passenger compartment. Thinking about that isn't going to help the current situation now, Twilight. She thought as she suppressed a frustrated huff. That didn't stop Twilight from leaning slightly against Matt as she began to worry over something else. I know that there's some big attack that's coming, and Shiny was acting really weird when he told me about it. He normally doesn't tell me much about the when and the where of his operations. Why would this one be any different? He said it was important, but he never said why. I just hope he doesn't do anything stupid and gets himself hurt. Cadence wouldn't want that. I had thought you would be wearing one of the Titan armors, Captain, Alvar said his voice cutting through the comfortable silence that had fallen over the cabin. Your current armor seems to lack the same degree of protection than what I've seen your comrades wear in the field. The Titan armor systems take two people to safely put on and remove, and I didn't think the power supply would last long enough to cover this trip. If that goes out, then I'm dead weight. Of course, the reduced protection is a bit of a concern but it's better than a simple off-duty uniform, Matt explained his left hand fiddling with the sword that Alvar had given him. I suppose it's just for show if all we have to do is impress Asterion's brother. If the meeting does end in a physical confrontation, then we will intervene, the large green armored stallion named Steel Song stated. Unlike the others in the passenger cabin, save Firecracker in her black armor, Captain Song and the ponies sitting beside him were all armored and armed as though they were expecting a fight. 
will be holding position in the hummingbird until the signal is given. A Pegasus whose name escaped twilight cleared his throat and nodded towards Alvar. If you don't mind me asking, where's your Myrmidon? I had been told that they never left the High Talons side when not in the peaks. Or am I remembering wrong, he asked, words tilted with an odd accent that Twilight couldn't quite put her hoof on. The question made Alvar snap to attention even while in his seated position. A Myrmidon's first duty is to the Griffins as a people. While his presence is assuring, my bodyguard has a duty that must be fulfilled in low peak. The young griffin shifted slightly, unclasping his talons to grip the sword that rested beside him. I am capable of defending myself, should the need arise. And you won't have to defend yourself, Asterion stated, his earlier glee giving way to legitimate grumpiness. He waved a hand at the armored ponies in the cabin dismissively. I don't see why Princess Luna is making all of you waste your time either. I certainly appreciate the use of this beautiful airship the compliment earning a proud smile from the pilot and a thumbs up from Asterion, dash but it's a waste to send the princess's little problem solvers for the ride. You'll be warming benches. Given that both Princess Twilight and High Talon Alvar are here, Princess Luna wanted insurance should the worst come to pass, Captain Song explained patiently. The worst? The worst would be my brother acting like a self-important cow, and I'd have to change his mind the hard way. When that explanation was met with blank looks, Asterion let out a dramatic sigh. My brother's been living in my shadow for years, and has been looking for some way to escape it. This is just another cry for attention, but he is a minotaur first and foremost. With evidence from everyone here, he'll have to concede the point that what he's doing is idiocy. And what happens if he has his own well-reasoned opinions and refuses to back down? Firecracker asked. Asterion's initial response was to look down at his hand and clench it into a fist. I find that it is rather hard to pose a convincing point to the Council of Consensus with a broken jaw. A small beep from the cockpit area preceded sky bolts interrupting into the conversation. We're approaching the outer fringes of the Minon Island chain now. We should be able to land in one minute. I wouldn't dawdle on the grounds though, there's a rather nasty squall coming in from the northwest. I really hope that we're able to convince Asterion's brother without too much trouble, Twilight thought as the conversation died down in anticipation of landing. A small bit of turbulence rattled the airship as it decelerated and descended, which did little to settle Twilight. I don't think I've ever gotten into an argument with Shiny that would have come to physical blows, but they're minotaurs. Maybe this is normal? That perplexing thought was quickly eclipsed by a chilling realization. To convince him, I'm going to have to talk about. An utterly alien presence forced itself past Twilight's defenses as though they weren't even there. The greatest mental shielding she could manage was crushed by her opponent thinking two little words, the apex. Twilight had gotten through one ragged breath before she felt Matt's hand against the base of her neck. A glance up to the human was rewarded with a small smile and a comforting squeeze from his hand was enough to put things into perspective. They aren't here. They can't hurt me anymore. I just have to talk about this once and then I don't have to talk about it ever again. I can do that. Captain Harris, Specialist Firecracker. Steel Song said as Asterion and his guests rose from their seats. We'll be ascending to a holding position off of the coast as soon as all of you are on the ground, but we can return in under 30 seconds. If there is any threat, use your radios. Asterion let out a laugh and ignored the guards as he marched through the center of the passenger compartment toward the boarding ramp. The others formed up behind him as the ramp descended, and Twilight's ears immediately fell back in response to the noise outside. Beyond the now lowered ramp was a well-manicured garden courtyard, though the various trees and foliage were bent as a result of the wind. Twilight trotted behind Asterion and Matt as they descended the ramp, and she couldn't help but look up into the pitch-black evening skies. Not a star could be seen past the veil of storm clouds that loomed low overhead. We had best hurry to the main house, I suspect if we wait any longer then we'll have to swim. Asterion shouted over the hummingbird's roaring engines as the airship lifted off from the courtyard. 
The house that Asterion had indicated was at the end of the cobblestone path that bisected the courtyard, its outer appearance framed by sculpted pillars and slabs of precisely cut stone and marble. Statues and busts lined the path, and in the gloom each seemed more ominous than the last. Twilight upgraded her trot to a canter to stay close to Matt's side as they marched to the massive entrance to Asterion's home. No guards or house staff appeared or made themselves known, but Asterion either didn't notice or care as he lifted one leg and planted a hoof in the center of the doors. Asverion, the minotaur bellowed loudly enough to overpower the boom of the doors flying open. Get your scrawny ass up here this instant. Twilight gave Firecracker a wary look, who returned it with a shrug and an eye roll. Is she saying this is normal for the minotaurs, or that this is being overdone for drama's sake? A cursory glance at the doors resulted in a double take when she confirmed that not only was there no damage from Asterion's kick, but there was a, judging by the number of hoof marks, use-worn metal plate at the point of impact. Any further analysis would have to wait as their target made his presence known. Must you bellow so, brother? A cultured voice, quiet as Asterion's was loud, spoke from one corner of the entrance hall. The voice's owner was almost a carbon copy of the elder Minotaur, from the color of his coat to his choice in wardrobe, but was drastically smaller. A book was folded in his hands as he reclined on a bench that sat by the windows, and he gave the group a curious look. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company this fine evening? Asterion huffed as he stomped over to the smaller minotaur. It's a terrible evening. In case you hadn't noticed, there's an out-of-season squall barreling in that will likely destroy the landscaping outside. A sigh escaped Asverion as he folded the book under one arm and cast a look out of the window. I suppose I'll have to surrender that point. Though I must say that was an amazing airship you arrived in. The basic airframe looked like it was based on that speedy little number that the equestrians developed but upgraded significantly. A pure beauty in form marred by the needs of function, yes. Quit stalling. You know why we are here, Asterion stated, his tone clipped. Very well then. It was always brass tacks and no small talk with you. Would you tolerate the slight delay so that we might have our debate in a more comfortable setting? Asverian queried as he rose, not even meeting Asterion's gaze as the larger minotaur and the others fell into step behind him. They're likely underground, Firecracker whispered to Twilight as the group left the entrance hall and down a staircase. The disguised changeling's goggled gaze turned slightly and she smiled. You were wondering where all the staff was? The minotaurs build their structures down, not up. Asverian was likely expecting his brother to show up and was waiting for us on the upper level. Well, I suppose that makes sense. If you don't have much land to build on, then you build in the direction you can, right? Twilight thought to herself as the group passed through another door. A growing sense of frustration took hold in her, so much so that she nearly bumped into Asterion when the group stopped for a moment when Asverian removed his jacket and reached out to place it on a coat rack behind the double doors. An apology was on the tip of her tongue but no pony seemed to notice her clumsiness as Asverian led the group into the room. You've got to focus, silly filly. If you aren't convincing enough then Minon's out of the war. If that happens. The last to enter the room had been Alvar the click of his talons momentarily accompanied by the door swinging slowly shut. Twilight glanced back over her shoulder to see just who had closed the door behind them out of reflex, and she froze in place. When Asverian had stopped to drop his coat off at the door, he wasn't hanging it on a coat rack behind the door. He was giving it to a minotaur toy, and a second stood on the opposite side of the doorway. Firecracker's reaction came a second later as she whirled about. Contact rear, she shouted as she interposed herself in front of Twilight. Hold, was the next shout, this one coming from Alvar. The young griffins low like a hunting cat with his wings spread and one talon on the hilt of his sword, but he made no move to attack as he stared at the machines by the door. Twilight's confusion at Alvar's order was only multiplied when her logical mind finally caught up with her initial fear response and she actually took in the details surrounding the Minotaur toy. Asverian's coat was folded over one of the toy's arms, and several other coats hung from the machine's horns. 
a stack of hats sat haphazardly atop his head, which only added to the absurdity of the scene. Neither machine had also moved a single step from its spot by the door. Well, it seems that my big reveal has been spoiled, Asvarian said with a dramatic sigh. He took in another breath and opened his mouth to speak but anything else he planned to say died as Asterian used his superior height to glare down at him. What have you done, brother? the elder Minotaur asked, his voice wavering with barely controlled rage. What have you done? I'm looking not just for the safety of our people, Asterian, but our prosperity as well, Asvarian snapped back. You would have us throw our lot in with the losing side, and they are going to lose so don't argue that point. With my new friends, I have learned how to tame the final invention, and secured our future while you cling to the past. Your new friends. Asterian roared as he took a step forward, forcing the other Minotaur to take a step back. Have you any idea what these things are capable of? Have you any idea of what your friends have already done? He waved one hand toward Alvar. You saw the same messages as I did about those Griffin Sky Pirates. High Talon Gerhardt put them down because their leader refused an honor duel with a caravan's lead guard, not for butchering and eating the caravan itself. How long would it have been before the Griffins would have imagined some slight and declared war with the world? Alvar did not reply immediately as he slowly turned to face the younger Minotaur. His talon never left his sword, and locked his eyes with Asvarian until he looked away. The next dismissive gesture was towards Princess Twilight and Firecracker. As if the equestrians are any better for the safety of this world. How many times in the past decade have we faced a potentially extinction-level crisis because the merciful and wise Celestia refused to permanently put down a threat that appeared in the past? He's being controlled, that explains everything. How one of the toys is here, and why he's doing this. Twilight realized, and she reached out with her senses for the proof she needed. Mind control requires a magical link between the controller and the controlled or even if it's an autonomous suggestion, there should be some sign, but there isn't. There isn't anything. A creeping sense of horror took hold in Twilight as she watched Asvarian bluster. He isn't being mind-controlled. He actually believes what he's saying, and he's not going to change his mind. Changelings? The same ones who nearly dethroned the princesses in an attempted coup? The dragons? who would just as much see the world burn if they can protect their shining hordes. The younger Minotaur continued to rant. And let us not forget the people who brought this war to our doorstep, there hasn't been a single time in the past two millennia when the humans haven't been killing each other over slavery, resources, and the fickle whims of their gods. Why don't we ask Captain Harris exactly what happened in Basra then, to give us a portrait of how benevolent humankind is? Throughout the entire rant, Matt's expression had grown increasingly dark, but he tensed when Asvarian addressed him directly. How can you possibly know about that? Who told you about Basra? The triumph on the Minotaur's face was marred only slightly by surprise. You are rather slower than I've been told. I know all about you from the same person who taught me the method for controlling the toys. I believe you know him as Vidi. Vidi? The question was spat by Firecracker like a curse as she also turned around. He's an avowed enemy of Earth and our world for heinous crimes. He is guilty of the same crimes you all are, doing what you feel is right to save your world, Asvarian cut Firecracker off with a tone not unlike a parent scolding a child. He has spent a great deal of time with me, explaining how the aliens plan to help his world and ours. Any who side with our unity will reap the rewards of it and there's still time. His tone softened and he reached out with one hand. There is no shame in admitting that you're on the wrong side of a conflict, but there is in clinging to it. A cool emotion fell on twilight then, brittle and icy. Asvarian's trying to convince us that he's on the side of right? After everything that's happened, he's trying to tell us that Vidi has our best interests at heart? That's, that's. Stunned silence hung in the room, with Asterian being the first to respond. Rather than words, he lunged forward with a raised fist and an enraged roar, only to be stopped mid-swing by Twilight's magic. 
The larger minotaur turned as best he could towards the elicorn to glare an accusation, only to find an equal amount of anger in her eyes. Asvarian, I would like to have a word with you privately, Twilight said as she leveled a glare with enough proverbial heat to melt rock. None of your toys, just us. Her glare swiveled to the others in the room when they tried to voice their objections, and they fell silent. To his credit, Asvarian recovered quickly and shot his brother a smirk before waving a hand to the door at the opposite end of the room. This way, princess, he said as he opened the door for twilight before following her through. The moment the door closed, he started to speak but was instantly cut off. Asvarian of Minon Twilight said crisply as she held her head high to glare at the Minotaur. You have admitted to conspiring with an avowed enemy of the Grufos Empire, the princesses of Ekestria, and the combined forces of Earth, and your own nation while in the presence of their representatives. I do not know what the penalty for treason is in Minon, but if Alvar were to mete out punishment then your head would be separated from your neck. Captain Harris would have you shot or hanged to death. In their infinite wisdom and mercy, the princesses would strive for redemption or banishment as your punishment. Princess, I understand that your personal experiences may be coloring your opinions, but you are letting your emotions get. I am perfectly aware of my emotions, and you should be thankful. Twilight snapped as her control wore thin. Were I not in such control, I would have let your brother beat you to death, or I would have done the beating myself. She pulled in another lungful of air to continue her yelling before letting it out in one long exhale. Breathe, Twilight. You brought him out here for a reason. I watched one of my friends die to an assassin that your good friend Vidi sent. Vidi himself tried to murder me while I was on Earth simply because I was there. There is exactly one thing that you can do that will get you out of this alive long enough to see redemption or banishment. Just as Twilight had realized that Asvarian would not be swayed by mere words, it seemed that the Minotaur came to the same conclusion regarding her if the frustration on his face was any indication. The Council of Consensus will not stand by while a claimant is abducted and tried without their consent. Your council shouldn't be as high of a priority if you realize that at least two of my companions don't want to let you leave the room alive, and I am sorely tempted to let them have their way with you. Twilight hissed as she pulled her saddlebags from her back and dug through them. All thoughts of the things that worried her over the past several hours and days were gone. The moral dilemmas she had felt over the deaths she had caused were also gone save a single memory, Lana's body choking and spasming while Twilight could do nothing but watch. I can't change what happened to her, but I think I can play a trick to convince this idiot that his friends aren't what they appear to be. A piece of paper and a pen were levitated from her saddlebags, and the writing utensil flew across the white sheet with blazing speed. Asvarian, you're going to read and memorize this, and when we go back into the room, you are going to recite it word for word. Any deviation or changes and I'll turn a blind eye while my companions render their judgment. Twilight stated as she very nearly pushed the sheet of paper directly into his face. Asvarian gave the sheet a skeptical look. Rather clever, princess, but it isn't going to work. But I shall play along just so that you can see how misplaced your anger is, he said with another dramatic sigh. He folded the sheet and handed it back to Twilight before throwing open the meeting room door. I have to say, you make a most compelling argument, princess. I had no idea that Vidi was so devious or evil. To think that I had nearly fallen for the trap of relying on the toys. I'll have them dismantled at once. Twilight ignored the shocked looks that were being thrown her way as she entered the room, her gaze firmly locked on the two toys at the opposite side. Neither had moved in reaction to what Asvarian had just said. A glance toward the younger Minotaur's increasingly smug expression only made the moment worse. Horse apples. He said the words and the toys were supposed to attack him for it. I was certain that would. Both toys let out an ear-splitting screech and charged. Asterian whirled about with his arms high in a fighting stance. Firecracker did the same, a small cloud of gold coins wrapped in telekinesis emerging from a pouch on her armor. Matt's hands fell to the sword at his hip and just begun to draw its length from the sheath. All seemed painfully slow when compared to Alvar. 
the young griffin was a blur as he shot forward with his sword already in talon. The toy on the right had just completed its first step before both of its feet were severed at the ankle as Alvar surged past at ground level. Alvar spun as he slid into the far wall and used it as a springboard to launch himself diagonally upwards. A slash mark from left hip to right shoulder bisected the already damaged toy as Alvar passed upwards. The young griffin rebounded off of one of the ceiling supports just as the second toy turned to face him. A moment later, the toy was cut cleanly down the middle from the crown of its head to its groin with Alvar landing in a three-point crouch at its feet. Alvar's sword had already been returned to its sheath before the two halves completed their tumble to the ground. Captain Song, this is Captain Harris, Matt said into his radio as he tried his best not to gape at Alvar's performance. Toys have been confirmed on the island, unknown numbers, no injuries at this point but we will be extracting with Asterion's brother. I think that, god damn it. He turned to face the now thoroughly shaken Asvarian, his eyes narrowed and his jaw clenched. Did you send a message to Vidi when we arrived? He requested that I notify him of any traffic to the island, Asvarian answered as he stared at the wreckage of the toys. It seemed like a simple enough request given our plans for the Fu. A right cross from Asterion dropped his brother to the ground in an unconscious heap. Just as quickly as the strike had come, Asvarian was lifted up onto his brother's shoulders. I'm assuming that more are coming. Asterion stated as much as asked. Firecracker and Matt's mirrored grimaces were enough to confirm it. Skybolt is reporting three aircraft making their way to our position now despite the storm. Their description matches Osprey's which means we could have 40 Exalt here within a minute, plus however many toys are still here, Matt summarized before giving his sword an aggravated look. You don't need a rifle, they said. All you'll be doing is talking, they said. Either way, we're dead if we stay here, Firecracker cut through the grumbling before turning to Twilight. Princess, are you able to teleport all of us at least twice in rapid succession? with the second destination being a moving target. When Twilight nodded in response, Firecracker tapped her hoof to her radio headset. Song, Firecracker. Can the hummingbird perform a scoop and scoot at the landing area? Understood, give us a five-second warning before you reach the area. Scoop and scoot. Isn't that what the male chariots do for express packages? Alvar asked as he made his way to the group. His right talon never left the hilt of his sword, which made his movement a series of three-legged hobbles and wing-assisted hops. Firecracker nodded in response before giving Twilight a serious look. Princess, when I give you the message, I need you to teleport all of us to the entrance hall that we came in from. From there you'll have to teleport us to the hummingbird as it passes over. Understood. Perfectly. I can do this. Twilight said with a nod as the others gathered around her. It's funny, if this was a test that Princess Celestia were giving me I'd be nervous. The thought of living with the knowledge that I failed her somehow seems more scary than the murderers that will kill us all if I mess up. The spell was already fresh in her memory and primed to activate as she double-checked to ensure everyone was close enough to be teleported. Her ears twitched as the sounds of screeching and metal footfalls filled the hallways around their meeting room. Three, two, one, now. A flash of lavender light and the snap of Twilight's teleport consumed the meeting room and replaced it with the meeting hall that they had walked through less than half an hour earlier, but the setting outside had drastically changed. Rain fell in heavy sheets and more than one bolt of lightning split the sky, but what was more concerning were the three unfamiliar airships that hovered over the landing area and the dozens of black-armored soldiers converging on their location. Despite all that was happening, Twilight's eyes were immediately drawn to the man walking straight down the center path as though he didn't have a care in the world. Even in the near impenetrable gloom of the night and the storm, it was easy for her to make out the man's tinted glasses and Cheshire smile as he approached. A moment later, Twilight's, and everyone else's, attention was lifted skyward as the hummingbird arrived. The conical forward shield was deployed and made short work of the Exalt airship on the right as Sky Bolt bounced up from just above sea level and rammed it out of position. Two bolts of lightning leapt from the broadside of the Hummingbird and struck down the second loitering airship. 
As the equestrian airship pivoted in place, the ramp descended and... Snap! Twilight teleported everyone safely inside. Ramps closing. Gun it, bolt! Captain Song shouted, and Twilight wrapped a foreleg around the nearest bench leg to keep from tumbling backwards due to the acceleration. Nearly a minute had passed before Twilight felt that she could safely let go. It seemed as though nobody else that had been teleported had found a safe hold during acceleration, and now Asterion and his brother, Firecracker, Alvar and Matt had all slid to the back of the passenger compartment into one big pile of bodies trying to stand up. Through the trip, Twilight had been gripped with anxiety, excitement, fear and anger, but the sight of everyone unharmed save for their dignity brought a new emotion to her, giddy relief. Everyone's safe. We did it. She thought, and despite the danger that they were still in, Twilight let out a laugh.